Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining today's webinar. This is Cheryl Jennison DeProza, and I'm joined today by Gino Sigismondi, as well as Dr. Mark Kenkel, who is a principal RF engineer here at Sure Incorporated. And today we're going to be discussing antenna setup and RF signal distribution. But before we get into that, just a few items of note. First of all, this arc, this webinar will be uh, will be recorded and will be in our archives. You can go to sure.com slash training and it will be there probably sometime early next week. You can also peruse all of our past topics there. There's a lot of great knowledge, so please feel free to take, um, take in that site and see all the great topics we have on offer. And then second of all, if we have time towards the end of the webinar, we will take questions. We did run a little long earlier this morning, so we didn't have too many, didn't have time for too many. But if you do have any questions, please type those in the question pane in the upper right hand corner of your screen. If you can't see the little question box, there should be a little orange box with a white arrow in it. Just click on that and that will maximize that little tool tool pane there. So ask any questions that you have and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. So that about wraps up all of the business. Uh, let's get into the meat of this webinar. Take it away, Gino. Great. Thanks, Cheryl. And thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, this is a topic that we think uh, must be close to a lot of people's hearts because uh, we've had some record setting pre-registration attendance on this webinar. So that's a, it's a great thing and we're happy you're all able to, to join us. And, uh, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Mark for joining us as well to lend his expertise. No problem. Um, and maybe, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll start there. So uh, th that implies an advanced degree of some sort. What exactly is that degree? I have a doctorate in electrical engineering and my uh, thesis topic was on small antenna design. See, so there you go. Um, that's uh, I think that uh, we hopefully uh, will get get you some useful information then, since we've got some some experience here at the table. So um, uh, let's uh, let's think we'll see what we're going to talk about here today. Um, you might be wondering what do I need to know about antennas, and um, you know there, there's there's lots of things to consider. I mean, obviously, if you're using a wireless a microphone system, there are antennas involved. They come with it. Um, and what where does it go beyond that? Well, first of all, I need to be clear. You know, when, when the things we're going to talk about today apply to systems that have uh, removable antennas on the receivers. Um, some of lower cost wireless mic systems, the antennas are permanently attached or sometimes even hidden inside of the receiver chassis. And you can't really see it and and or or do anything with them. And if that's the case, it's not a whole lot you can do. But um, for more professional or higher end systems, you know, it is possible to uh, to remove those antennas and either choose a different antenna or place the antenna somewhere else or get into things like antennas distribution. So if you have, you know, more than just a couple of systems, um, you're going to be thinking about things like, you know, antenna distribution to allow multiple receivers to share a common pair of antennas. And if the receivers are hidden, they're in an equipment closet or they're, you know, somewhere off stage and you want to get the antennas closer, then you need to deal with remote antenna considerations, cabling, amplifiers, that sort of a thing. And, uh, and then you have, uh, you know, long range operation, maybe you need some sort of uh, directional antennas or antennas with some gain to try and, and maximize the distance. You know, these are all the kinds of things that you might be thinking about that would uh, require you to, you know, choose different types of antennas. So we'll get into the different kinds of antennas that you can choose from. Again, there's many different types of antennas in existence, but we're going to focus on the kinds that are useful for wireless mic applications. Uh, where to place those antennas for optimum reception. Other things you need to consider as far as cabling and amplifiers go for remote mounting. Antenna distribution, which again is multiple receivers sharing a common set of antennas. And uh, if we have some time, antenna combining, which is I guess sort of the opposite of distribution, but that's taking multiple antennas scattered around a venue or in uh, in different rooms and making sure that uh, you can use uh, to get good coverage for wireless microphones across uh, different rooms of a venue. So with that, uh, I thought it'd be a good place to start would be kind of an explanation of what, what is a radio wave, because that's that's the things we're trying to transmit and pick up with our antennas. Um, Dr. Mark, why don't you tell us a little bit about what a radio wave is? Okay. Uh well, Gino, I think your your graphic shows uh, a lot of important features of an electromagnetic wave. It has uh, an electric field component and a magnetic field component, and uh, they they oscillate uh, together, so they kind of build off of each other. The electric field generates a magnetic field. The magnetic field again generates an electric field. So, uh, what's important to note in your in your picture is that. And this is what we would call linearly polarized, and that the electric field travels along one axis. In your picture, it's the y-axis. Uh, 
And so as the electric field oscillates in this kind of sinusoidal pattern, it stays in a line. The same thing is true with the magnetic field. It stays along the, the x-axis. And these waves travel at the speed of light. So unlike a sound wave, which, you know, takes, you know, travels at a, at a much slower rate, uh, uh, electromagnetic waves travel so fast that uh, we can communicate over them without a lot of, uh, without a lot of uh, delay. So that makes them very useful for communication systems. And the reason that we like to point out uh, the, this little bit of uh, information here about the radio wave is that because, well, and the reason the antenna thing is confusing to a lot of people is that um, human beings are not, uh, we don't have a sense that detects radio waves. We can't see them. We can't hear them. They're right. kind of mysterious. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're mysterious. <laughs> and without specialized equipment, it's hard to, 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 to know what's going on there to be able to, uh, to work with them uh, effectively. So, um, so, you know, here you can at least get a visual of what's, um, what might be, be happening out there. Um, and, and again, the tra radio waves do travel at the speed of light, which means you can apply the wave equation uh, to determine, uh, to learn something more about the, the waves themselves. Um, any wave has a wavelength associated with it, and using the wave equation, you can uh, figure out what the wavelength is if you know the frequency or vice versa. The, the constant here, of course, is the speed of light at which they at which they travel. And again, this is worth looking at because as you can find out from applying the equation here is that as you go higher in frequency, wavelengths get shorter, or as you go lower in frequency, wavelengths get longer. And that plays directly into antenna design and, and the size of antennas. Uh, antennas have to be of a certain length or a certain size, depending on the frequency that you're trying to pick up. So not all antennas can pick up all radio waves with the same sensitivity because the antenna has to be somewhat tuned to the wavelength of the frequency that you're trying to pick up. So a um, little bit of math, but we won't, we won't dwell on that. Um, but that does, um, the wavelength concept provides some interesting insight then into how a radio wave behaves when it encounters an obstacle, particularly a medical ob obstacle. So radio waves will reflect uh, off of metal obstacles. Other non-metal obstacles, whether it's drywall or concrete or, or glass, uh, something like that, will allow the radio wave to pass through, although there'll probably be some um, attenuation, just like a solid wall attenuates sound waves as well. They don't pass through at 100% efficiency. Same thing with any solid object, but a metal obstacle will actually reflect a radio wave if it is large compared to the wavelength of the frequency that we're interested in. So in this example, when the wavelength is short or small compared to the size of the obstacle, the wave is reflected. And therefore, if your antennas, receive antennas are behind that obstacle, you, uh, you don't get a lot of pickup, uh, if any at all. And uh, we'll actually uh, revisit this concept in a little bit um, with, with some, some practical illustrations. So, but if the if the wavelength is long compared to the obstacle, uh, like it's just a small metal post or something like that, then you're not going to get too much reflection. The the wave will just blow right by it, and life is good. Where it gets a little bit more interesting is when you look at openings in metal obstacles as well, because if you have an opening in a, a metal, uh, say, metal grid work or fencing of some sort, and the wavelength is small compared to the openings in a metal obstacle, again, it'll pass right through it, no problem. But if the wavelengths are long or large compared to the size of the opening, then it reflects almost as if it encountered a solid metal object, even though you might be able to see through it. Again, if it's a small screen or something like that, that light waves can pass through, the uh, lower frequency uh, radio waves that we're dealing with might not get through at all. Why are we telling you this? Well, I mean, this is this comes up a lot. Here's a photograph from an actual application that you know we got a call about, and this we get this call just about every spring where there's some new ballpark opening somewhere, and you can see there's five baseball diamonds kind of radiating out from this center kiosk here, and the, the common application here is they want a wireless microphone to be able to go out to the pitcher's mound at any of these ball fields and and uh, make announcements, and. It's a great concept, but they want to put the receivers here inside the central kiosk, maybe with antennas on the roof. The problem, if you look closely, is that there's a chain link metal fence backstop on each one of these ball fields. And chain link, if you think about the opening, what is that, about three inches or so maybe in the in a chain link? You're lucky. If you're lucky, <laughs> right? And the radio waves that we're dealing with at UHF frequencies are about two feet long. 
So that's significantly bigger than the opening in the chain link fence. And so you take your microphone out to the pitcher's mound and you try to use it and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, maybe you're getting a lot of dropouts and that's because of that chain link fence that is, you know, blocking the signal from the transmitter and preventing it from getting from the receiver. So we're, we talk a lot about how important line of sight is in antenna placement. You actually want to be able to see the antennas. But in this case, you can see the antennas, but the radio waves can't because they are, again, long compared to the openings in the chain link fence. So you always have to kind of watch out for that first sort of rule of thumb here. So let's get directly into different types of antennas that we might encounter here. Um, and uh, first of all, I mean, let's explain what an antenna is or what's its job. Okay, well, an, an antenna is a, a transducer. It's going to turn uh, an electric signal, like from an oscillator or something, into an electromagnetic wave. So we're going to have a varying voltage, and uh, that voltage will vary across, the, in this case, a, a dipole. Uh, the the voltage is applied to the center of the dipole, and as it varies, it produces an electromagnetic wave uh, that varies with the voltage, and uh, it's going to propagate across space. And when it sees the next antenna, or you know, wherever the receiver is, um, it will produce a voltage at the center of the antenna based on that propagating wave. So, it's just one way of turning a voltage into a, a wave, and then from a wave back into a voltage. And if we're talking about passive antennas, in this case, they're reciprocal, right? That, words, no that's difference. absolutely correct. So uh, a passive antenna works equally well as a transmit antenna or a receive antenna. Okay. And maybe just a little bit of explanation here with a with an example um, of how how an antenna works. Like how what what is it? What's going on in there that makes it do what it does? Well, a, a lot of uh, what we need to know about antennas, we learned in grade school, but our grade school teachers didn't tell us that we were learning antenna theory at the time. So if you imagine a battery, uh, in this case, something like a 9-volt battery, and you hook it up to two wires, one going to the left, one, the other one going to the right, then the positive terminal will attract negative charges because opposite charges attract and, and like charges repel. And the, uh, likewise, the negative terminal will attract positive charges, and that leaves negative charges exposed at the end of the antenna. So now those antenna, uh, those charges, they attract charges on, uh, say, another antenna. that it's, Here it's connected to a resistor that might represent our receiver. So you can see where the, uh, from our transmitter source with, with the battery, the, uh, the charges at the ends of the antenna, they're attracting opposite charges on the receive side. So if we were to flip the battery around, then we would expect the charges to, to move and a current to flow in our antenna, which then forces currents to flow on the receive side. So yeah. that's, and it's all just about like charges uh, repelling and opposites attracting. So by flipping that battery back and forth, what we're really kind of simulating there is alternating current. Right. A, a high-frequency oscillator. Right. Of course, you couldn't physically turn it fast enough to actually right. <laughs> make it work as a radio wave. But No, you'd be, you'd be awfully fast. <laughs> uh, but you could see now if you were to take the receive antenna and turn it 90 degrees to the transmit antenna, current flowing back and forth on the transmit side wouldn't, wouldn't force a current to flow through the resistor or you know, into the receiver. So they have to be polarized or turned parallel to each other. So uh, we would consider that linearly polarized. Right. And we'll see more about polarization when we get into some of the specific um, uh, placement recommendations that we have. But that's an important concept to keep in the back of your mind. Um, the next thing, as we kind of alluded to earlier with the wave equation, is that, again, the size of the antenna is related to the wavelength of the frequency that you're trying to pick up. So the two you know, examples of antennas we're looking at here are both what we would consider a half-wave antenna, which is so named because the length of the antenna is one-half of the wavelength of the frequency that we're trying to pick up. But the top antenna is would be for a VHF system, where your uh, you know, wavelengths are about you know five to six feet long, and the bottom one would be a UHF half-wave antenna where the frequencies we're trying to pick up have a wavelength of about two feet or so. And and that's why you see these different size antennas for VHF and UHF systems or even, you know, shorter ones if you look at what's on your, uh, your Wi-Fi router or something like that. Again, that antenna length is specific to the to the frequencies that we're that we're dealing with here. 
and then the, the physical shape and size and design of the antenna, which you see several examples of here, again, these are all antennas, they're all UHF band antennas, but because of their physical differences, that affects how it performs in terms of whether or not it has any directionality associated with it, if there's any additional gain associated with it, and the bandwidth or the range of frequencies that it's sensitive to. And we'll get a little bit more into specifics in a, in a second here on that, but the, those things matter. And then finally, antennas do have a characteristic um, impedance. Uh, and what we're dealing with for professional wireless mic systems, it's a it's a 50 ohm antenna, so that means 50 ohm cable. And uh, the receivers, of course, are designed to be you know interface at 50 ohms as well. Um, you might encounter 75 ohm cable out there a lot too, just because a lot of uh, cable TV systems happen to use 75 ohm. But for our purposes, it's 50 ohm, and we'll uh, we'll get into more details in that when we talk about the cabling itself. So the first kind of antenna we want to talk about is your basic sort of omnidirectional antenna, which you might not be aware. When we talk about an omnidirectional antenna, it's actually a little bit um, different uh, than when you think of like an omnidirectional microphone or something like that. Maybe, Mark, you can elaborate that a little bit. Right. So this is a, a half-wave dipole antenna, and uh, it's vertically polarized. So when we say omnidirectional, what we're saying is that as I walk around the antenna, it, I get equal pickup. Uh, in the horizontal plane. So, you know, consider this, you know, uh, an antenna that's standing up, say, in the middle of the room, and if you walk around it, uh, you can't tell, uh, or the antenna doesn't care uh, what angle you are uh, with respect to the antenna. It's going to pick it up equally well. But you can see in the pattern, uh, the vertical pattern on the right, that uh, that's showing you more of an elevation pattern. And uh, you can see that it would have be kind of like a donut hmm. in that uh, you know it has a hole in the middle. So these antennas don't propagate uh, top and bottom. You know they're so off the ends. There's there's very little energy coming off of there. So if this antenna picture here were laying right on top of this vertical pattern, that's what you would see in terms of the sensitivity. Right now, and if you imagine another uh, antenna, or like in our battery example. Uh, as charges move back and forth on this antenna, if if another antenna is polarized the same way but standing on top of this one, the the charges moving back and back and forth on on the antenna really don't make charges move back and forth on the other antenna because they're they're in line, they're collinear. Mm -hmm. So you need to be in the horizontal plane. And just to kind of give you the practical end of this, right? Here's an example from a, a, a of a actual <laughs> um, uh, from a customer. Unfortunately, sent us this picture. They'd probably be embarrassed if they knew we were using it. But circled here in yellow um, is antennas uh, attached to the back of a receiver, and and you can see the ends of them here. So this would be incorrect antenna placement because with an omnidirectional antenna, because again you know, the, the sensitive part of the antenna is broadside to the antenna, not the end of it. So now you've got your antennas essentially the, the least sensitive part of the antenna facing towards where the microphones are. And again, not in the same polarization right. either. So, so there's two things wrong with this. Yeah, there's two at things least. wrong with it. At least. There's actually more. We'll revisit this picture again later. It was kind of a, a gold mine in, in that regard. So, um, but that, so that's, that's something to keep in mind when you're placing your omnidirectional antennas. Um, now, the most common type of omnidirectional antenna that's included with most receivers that have detachable antennas is the half-wave antenna, again, which, as I mentioned, is you know, called that because it's one half the wavelength of a UHF um, frequency. Um, and the, even though the connector is on the bottom of it, it's actually uh, electrically kind of looks like the simplified diagram on the right here, which makes it more of a, of a really a dipole antenna and maybe... Right. So like it... It's really hard to tell just by looking at the outside of an ant antenna, whether it's quarter wave or half wave. Uh, you really need to open it up to look inside and to see how it's constructed. And in, in this case, uh, one of the things that kind of helps tip us off that it's a half wave is that it's a little bit fatter at the bottom end than it is at the top. So inside there's a, uh, a metal cylinder and a coax cable that goes up the middle of the cylinder and then the top part of the, or the center conductor of the coax continues on, becomes the upper part of the antenna. And then the, the shield of the coax gets tied to a cylinder that then comes back down and forms the, the other half of the antenna. So uh, these can, are, what's nice about these is they, they can be remote mounted. 
they have there's two halves of the antenna. Mm-hmm. Right, and so that means you you they don't need to be on the receiver. You can mount this sort of antenna anywhere you need to. Right, it, right. it has both halves of the antenna are are to, are part of the antenna. Right, versus the quarter wave antenna, um, which is is not uh, a dipole antenna. Um, and is again a quarter of the wavelength of the frequency that we're interested in yeah. picking up, but it re- since it doesn't have that opposing uh, element to it, needs the ground plane. Correct. Right? So what's happening here is the ground plane uh, forms an image. If you imagine the ground plane like a mirror, mm-hmm. uh, you you get a mirror image, and that that image is forming the other half of the antenna for you. Okay. So you can make your antennas half as big. Right. But you can't, re- <laughs> <laughs> but you can't uh, remote mount them. They require either being on a metal chassis or some other f- form of ground plane, uh, so that they get that other half of the antenna. Right. And so we'll see that when we talk about the rules of thumb for remote mounting antennas, and that's number one is don't remote mount your quarter wave antennas. If they're on the receiver, if they're on the rack ear, that's part of the receiver chassis. That's usually fine, but they really aren't useful anywhere else. You'd want to make sure you get. Um, a half wave antenna for your remote applications. And the other thing to consider too, again, is that not all, um, as I mentioned, not all antennas are sensitive at all frequencies. Your typical sort of half wave whip type antenna like you see on the left here um, has a bandwidth of about uh, uh, 60 megahertz or so. Um, usually we try to print that kind of range on the antenna itself, um, but there is some limitation. However, uh, it's not necessarily um, uh, a brick wall when you get outside the limits of the antenna, correct? That's correct. So uh, as a rule of thumb, I like to, I like to think that you could probably, if, if you can see the center frequency printed on the antenna, or if you know the center frequency of the antenna, uh, it's good for about 20% of that center frequency number. Uh, you, you probably really good over 10%, mm-hmm. but, uh, if you have to stretch it, uh, you can. Uh, it's not a brick wall. It's it's kind of forgiving. Mm-hmm. But the be- the best practice is that if you are you know combining multiple frequency band or frequency range systems together through antenna distribution or something like that, you'd really want to get into an antenna that has the bandwidth to accommodate all of the frequencies optimally, like the wide band antenna we see right. on the that, right here. It gives you the freedom to use whatever frequency happens to be available. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Uh, and this antenna, I mean, again, that's part of the reason it's as big as it is, is that's what gives it that bandwidth. Right. That's what gets, so the, the thinner, the narrow, the thinner the antenna, the, the more narrow the bandwidth. A lot of times bandwidth increases significantly by getting it uh, a bigger diameter uh, antenna element. So now looking at directional antenna types, these can be useful when you're in a, a, a more crowded, uh, harsh RF environment where you want to take advantage of the directional properties of the antenna to sort of you know, minimize pickup of unwanted sources and maximize pickup of the desired um, transmitting devices, uh, just like you would use a cardioid microphone on a stage to you know, pick up the sounds you want and try to get less pickup of the sounds you don't want. Same sort of basic application um, applies here, as well as trying to increase the uh, operating range of your system because these directional antennas typically have some uh, gain or forward gain associated with them that makes them a little more um, sensitive in the direction they're pointing than uh, that an omnidirectional antenna might be. And common types are both the, the, the Yagi and the log periodic types of antennas, which I've, I've, I've heard people use those terms interchangeably, but they're actually not, not the same thing. No, uh, they're both directional antennas, but uh, the Yagi antenna has one driven element, which is usually a dipole or a folded dipole, and then next to it are just uh, pieces of wire that are uh, passive, and the driven element is making current flow on the passive elements. So, and be, with proper spacing and sizing of those passive elements, you can get uh, some directionality. In a log periodic, uh, the antenna, all of the elements are driven, and it gives us a little bit more freedom to control uh, bandwidth, uh, directionality, uh, antenna impedance, uh, because more of the elements are driven. We have more control over how the antenna performs. Okay, good. And so what we're looking at here, the sure antenna is a log. Those are period. log periodic. Okay. 
Now, one of the the other things that's kind of important here is just the, the term gain. Mm. Uh, if you were to consider uh, an antenna like a like a light bulb, uh, an omnidirectional antenna, like a light bulb shines uh, everywhere. And so, if I if I were in a dark room with a light bulb in the middle of the room, if I stood in the corner, I would receive a certain amount of light. And if I were then to add, a, say, a reflector to the, to the light bulb, like in a flashlight, I could then point the, the, the light right at the person in the corner. So as far as the person in the corner is concerned, it just got brighter in his location. Even though no additional energy was spent, uh, we didn't increase the power to the light bulb or anything like that, uh, the, the rest of the room got darker. But the person in the corner, he sees more energy. And the same thing is true with directional antennas. We, uh, p- with these passive directional antennas, we're, we're taking the energy and kind of focusing it in one direction. And what makes that, I think, uh, maybe kind of can confuse people sometimes is this particular antenna also has an, an amplifier built onto it as well. It's an active directional antenna. So that gain you're referring to is just by nature of it being directional. Right. It's kind of like the reflector on a flashlight. It, uh, it gives you some directionality. Uh, but uh, this is giving you gain in two ways. It's giving you uh, directionality of, of the signal, uh, which as far as you know, anybody on the outside is concerned, their signal just got brighter, <laughs> uh, and as, as well as some amplification. And it's worth noting that that ampl- amplified gain, there, the active gain, is for the purposes of making up um, loss in your antenna cable, right. not to try and increase the sensitivity of the antenna. Right. And once you add the amplifier, the, the antenna is no longer reciprocal. It doesn't work as well as a receiving and transmitting antenna. It, it now only works in one direction. So only receiving. And only receiving. Right. But this is a wideband antenna, right? So it covers the UHF. In this case, this one covers the UHF band that we need. Right. Right. Okay. Um, and then just some, again, kind of rules of thumb when using these antennas, again, we like to recommend them really more for longer range applications. Again, they, they can be useful in shorter applications if you're just trying to take advantage of the directionality of the antenna and not increased sensitivity. But, uh, you know, we far too often see these antennas, you know, directly off the side of the stage by the monitor console, 10 feet from whoever's using the wireless microphone. And that can actually make things worse instead of better because that gain of the antenna plus the amplifier gain, if the cable runs are short, you can actually hit the receivers too hard and um, and, and and degrade the performance of the system. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But that's, uh, you know, that's why we say, you know, I mean, 100 feet, maybe it doesn't need to be quite that far. But, you know, in, in general, it, we end up seeing that these antennas get used uh, you get overused in applications where maybe you don't really need them. But again, they can be you know used correctly, it's certainly an advantage there. And make sure you stay within its acceptance angle, which again is roughly like that of like a cardioid pattern microphone. It's about 120 degrees. Um, and again, there, there are both passive and active versions of these antennas available. The active one is the one that we seem to see the most often, but we do have, and there are available passive directional antennas as well that have the, the, the gain of the antenna itself with no additional amplification. And again, active or passive, your choice there is based on whether or not you need the additional amplification to make up for cable loss. And then the last type of antenna we want to look at here is something that's called a, a, a helical antenna, which is a, a bit more specialized, but uh, you've probably seen these in um, maybe more major events, like if you watch you know, the Super Bowl or Grammy Awards or you know, a, a harsh RF environments where there's lots of wireless and long-range applications is kind of where you see these. But what what is this thing? Okay, well, a helical antenna is, is you can see, has a, a narrower beam width, and uh, the element is wound helically around uh, a center core. In, in this case, it's a, a hollow cylinder. And what's nice about this is that uh, instead of being linearly polarized, where the electric field just goes up and down along one axis, now the electric field will rotate with time. Uh, in a circle, and we call that circularly polarized. What's nice about that is if the receiver, or let's say the transmitter is, uh, you know, at maybe an unpredictable angle, it could be vertical, could be horizontal, could be some angle in between, a circularly polarized receiving antenna won't care Mm -hmm. because what what you've done is you've traded off a little bit of, uh, I'm always perfectly polarized with the transmitter for, uh, I, I'll never lose reception 
you know, I'm, I'm never going to be unpolarized with you. Mm. I'll be polarized with you the majority of the time. So okay. uh, it's a, a little bit of trade off of uh, I might have a little bit of sensitivity loss, but I'm not going to be mismatched in terms of polarization. And that sensitivity loss may be made up by the fact that now you've got an antenna that's, you know, much more sensitive, right? Correct. Right. It's got 9 to 11 dB of gain. So a little, you know, if you lost 3 dB in terms of polarization mismatch, you've made up, you've got six more additional due to the antenna gain. Yeah. So these antennas, very directional, lots of gain, and again, circularly polarized. So, you know, you're not going to use these in every application, but in certain, certain situations they can be definitely uh, I've seen point to point done with these two uh, across the across a river where mm -hmm. they took two circularly polarized antennas and pointed them at each other to get the the maximum uh, range that they could get wow any idea what that range was any guesses uh, I, I think it was over a half a mile wow that's a, you know, with a with a 10 milliwatt transmitter that's not too bad it's not too bad <laughs> Okay, so now that we've looked at the different types of antennas that are available, let's uh, look into some some best practices as far as where how you want to place those antennas. And the first thing we want to talk about is the orientation. This still kind of plays into the whole concept of the polarization of the uh, radio wave itself and how it uh, plays into the, your antennas. So I'm just, I'm actually just going to cut right to the chase here and say you know the in a diversity wireless mic system that has two antennas. I think everyone even kind of knows this intuitively, even if you don't know why, you sort of put them at 90 degrees from each other. Um, but why is that? Why would we do that? Well, because we don't know what uh, what angle the transmit antenna might be at, uh, you know, could, could be, in, as in your picture, it could be uh, vertically polarized, but it could also be tilted to the left or tilted to the right. Or if it's uh, a handheld mic, completely unpredictable. Correct. And so by splaying your antennas at 90 degrees, uh, you've kind of hedged your bets. Uh, <laughs> neither antenna is perfectly polarized with the transmitter, but always, you know, one of them will always be partially polarized with the transmitter. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that al allows you to, to kind of make up for the fact that, you know, the transmitter is a little bit unpredictable, as well as... I may be receiving a signal that's a reflection off of a metal surface. And as the transmit uh, signal reflects off a surface, its polarization can, can shift a little bit. So if your direct path is not, the, not necessarily the received path due to maybe something's blocking you or multiple signals are arriving, uh, by, polarize, or by putting your antennas at 90 degrees from each other, you've given yourself what's called polarization diversity mm -hmm. on top of the received diversity that you already had. Wow, that's great. And and it could be like you see here, you know, the kind of traditional sort of rabbit ears look, but you could also just put one perfectly vertical and one perfectly horizontal. Right, like, right. You just want to be 90 degrees uh, to each other. Okay, great. The next thing um, is spacing. So again, in a diversity system, to to achieve the the benefit of diversity, you want to make sure that those antennas are not too close together. And again, for um, the, the minimum spacing uh, should be at least a quarter wavelength. Your best spacing for for best diversity performance is achieved at a full wavelength, which again, um, for UHF systems, is about a two foot wave. So if your antennas are about two feet away from each other, that's that's really the best spacing. And you can go further away f than two feet apart, but um, it doesn't necessarily get any better. When you right, right. There's a, there's a point of diminishing return. So uh, sometimes, you know, when you space them further apart, it's because you have uh, a need to cover uh, a larger area, you know, like one on one side of a stage, one on the other side of a stage. Uh, that way you always know the artist will be close to at least one of the antennas. Uh, but the idea really is that, that they're in completely different spaces. They're not correlated to each other. We would expect the electromagnetic field to be different at each of the antenna locations. If you, as they get too close to each other, less than a, a quarter wavelength, then the field that they see is very highly correlated. And so if the field were to drop at one antenna, chances are it dropped at the other as well. So by spacing further apart, we've kind of... Uh, assured more randomness in the, the field that the that will the antennas will see however though if, I, I think as you noted earlier um, even if they're less than a quarter wavelength apart 
two antennas is still better than one. That's right? that's true. Sometimes it only takes a, a few inches of difference to uh, to get you out of trouble, mm -hmm. uh, and we see that a lot on our portable uh, body pack uh, receivers that yes. have two antennas. Uh, certainly not the optimal spacing, but uh, but a lot of times that second antenna makes a big difference. Sure. That's why we don't sell uh, really many single antenna systems at all, especially not on the wireless mic side of things. Yeah. So uh, that diversity is a great thing. Um, next thing here is minimum distance. That is not getting your transmit and receive antennas too close to each other. Uh, you know, most people want to know how far away can I go? How What's the distance? What's the range on this system? And that's, that's great. But the opposite side of things is, again, not getting too close. And this plays directly into something I alluded to earlier, which is that you can actually degrade the performance of the system when you um, cause overload conditions in your receivers. And this becomes particularly problematic when we're talking about multiple system setups. You know, in a single system, one by itself probably doesn't matter a whole lot. But when you have multiple transmitters on the air, multiple receivers, um, intermodulation becomes a big problem. And, um, you know, we're going to talk a lot more about intermodulation in next month's webinar, which is about frequency um, coordination specifically. But, you know, you can have a well-coordinated set of frequencies that suddenly doesn't work so well if you're overloading the front end of all of your receivers, which again, could be, could happen in a number of ways. It could be that you just have, you know, your transmitters maybe have a high power mode that you're using when you probably shouldn't be. Could be you have too high a gain of antennas, or it could just be that your plane just too, too close. close. Yeah. <laughs> so adding a little bit of space there, uh, at least 10 feet or so, will help kind of, uh, you know, ensure that you're not overloading the receivers. And, and uh, most of our receivers nowadays have an RF overload indicator on them that shows you if that receiver is being um, overloaded. And you would want to try and again remedy that by increasing the distance, lowering the transmitter power, making sure there's not too much antenna gain. And in a distributed antenna system, sometimes that overload isn't really impacting the receiver that's telling you it's overloaded. It might be impacting uh, some of the other receivers. So the receiver is trying to tell you you have a problem. And the problem may, might not manifest itself on that channel, mm -hmm. but it will manifest itself somewhere else. Yeah, definitely pay attention. It's telling you which transmitter the problem's coming from. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Uh, and then height is a big thing too. A height of at least six feet off the floor for your antennas. Why, why six feet? Because human beings are great absorbers of radio frequency energy. Um, uh, it turns out that uh, that seawater uh, is a pretty good absorber of uh, radio waves, and humans are mostly seawater. So when you have a whole room full of them, that could cause problems for your uh, for your reception. Again, we talk a lot about line of sight, and line of sight literally means like a clear sight, not only with metal out of the way, but also with, you know, human bodies that can be absorbing the radio frequencies. Where you see this um, a lot, this particular application is like in a, maybe a hotel AV or conference center application where the wireless uh, receivers are on, you know, little portable carts that get rolled into the back of the room with the antennas just on the receiver on the cart, which is only about three feet off the floor or so. They're on a table at the back of the room and you do a sound check, the room empty, everything works great. Several hundred bodies pour into the room for the keynote address and then we get the panic phone call saying ah, it's not working i'm getting dropouts now it worked fine during sound check and that's because what changed well you have a room full of humans that weren't there before so if you just get a couple of mic stands put those antennas up nice and high in the air so you really do have a clear line of sight that will go a, a long way towards uh you know helping with your your uh, reception yeah and there's also applications where if you can get the antenna, say, up uh, towards the ceiling, you, you know that you're never going to overload your system because mm -hmm. the transmitters uh, here here on the ground <laughs> or right. you're on your body, you're not going to be able to get closer than 10 feet to your receive antennas. That's true. So keeping them up in the air, antenna height is always your, your very good friend when we're talking about antenna placement. And the next thing here, we are almost done with our placement rules of thumb here, but is avoid parallel metal surfaces. That could be a metal um, stud in the wall, um, which you don't want. You could also be other antennas as well. They're all made of metal. They're all um, parallel surface. But, but why is that bad? Well, as we pointed out with our, our battery uh, slide, that uh, when one antenna has got a current flowing on it, it will cause currents to flow on other uh, metal antennas. And the same thing would be true if it's a wall, uh, 
an adjacent antenna on any other parallel metal surface. So in the case of, you know, the antenna that you have vertically next to a wall, uh, the current flowing on that antenna is going to cause an opposite current to flow in that metal surface. And then, so both will produce waves that will cancel each other. So ultimately, I don't get any either radiation or, or reception from a, an antenna like that. Uh, where we have multiple antennas next to each other, uh, that can form an array which changes the directionality or it gives you directionality to your antennas that you didn't expect. <laughs> so the pattern, it's, it becomes kind of more unpredictable. It's not really like right. omni like you would want right. to expect. So, and sometimes these things, you know, work well enough that you're like, well, it, it, it works, but you might find that your range is degraded. Mm -hmm. And so if you're, if you're having, you know, range issues where it's like, oh, I'm on the fringe and it's not getting what I would expect or what I would get with a single when I'm only operating one transmitter and receiver, uh, the reason might be that these antennas are interacting with each other. So, and that's this is the argument for antenna distribution, which we're going to get to in a minute, is to avoid the situation like you see on the right-hand side here, where if you have multiple rack-mounted receivers without antenna distribution, then each pair of antennas ends up stacked up like that, which causes these issues. But interesting to note, though, that in the middle there where you see the antenna perpendicular to a metal surface, that's perfectly fine. Right. There, there there's an image of the antenna formed uh, by that uh, that metal surface, but it's producing a pattern that will add with the uh, with the antenna that's that's present. So if you have to mount on your antenna on top of a metal rack or something, and it's parallel to the rack. I mean, sorry, perpendicular to the rack. Um, then that's that's fine. So let's just, for illustrative purposes, take a look at maybe some questionable antenna placement. Um, hopefully, after everything we've said so far, the the issue here is somewhat apparent. But again, you've got high gain directional antennas that are very nicely um, splayed at 90 degrees, but behind a metal cage uh, with maybe you know two three inch openings in it there. So again, that two foot uh, UHF wave probably not getting through there with a whole lot of success. Um, you know, they probably could have saved a bunch of money on the antennas by just taking the half wave omnis and putting them on the other side of the cage because you can see where this person is uh, standing here. I mean, it's only what, maybe a 30, 40 foot throw to the stage there. So they've got antenna gain and probably some amplified gain looks like on top of that mm -hmm. for to cover a very short distance. Right. You wouldn't need that at all if the antennas were just, you know, where, where they could see the radio waves clearly, right? We can we can see the antennas, but the radio waves can't. So that's uh, kind of a problem there. Uh, and then here, our, this picture, I told you we'd revisit this one again. So not only were these antennas uh, in the incorrect uh, polarization angle here, but uh, they're also inside of a steel enclosure with the rack door closed. And you'll also notice, again, that this rack device below it providing a parallel metal surface less than a quarter wavelength from the antenna itself. So you've got all kinds of things working against you here. Um, and as you know, and this it's is amazing. It worked at all. It's amazing. It worked at all. So they called up and said, we're only getting about 10 feet of range. We said, that's pretty good. Um, but anyway, uh, these can, things can be so easily fixed by just putting the antennas, number one, vertically instead of horizontally, 90 degrees outside of the metal rack and life would be so much better. Uh, here's, and again, too many antennas, too close together, and they um, interact with each other, which isn't necessarily a good thing either. So now moving on to uh, considerations for cabling when remote mounting antennas. Once you've decided where to, to place the antennas, you need to make sure that you choose the right kind of cable and or amplification to make sure there's not too much loss or say it again, too much gain through your antenna system. And the way this question typically gets put to us is how far away can I remote mount my antennas? And the answer is it depends. Mostly it depends on what kind of cable you are using. Um, here's cutaway examples of two very common types of 50 ohm cable, RG58 on the top and RG213 on the bottom. And you can tell just by looking at the cutaways the, the difference, right? The RG213 is a uh, much larger diameter cable, um, which gives it much better properties in terms of how much loss there is. And that's what you really want to be looking at. The important numbers are here, uh, attenuation in you know, dB per 100 feet, um, 
we don't have the exact frequency we need, but we can kind of interpolate sort of by going in between here. And, and generally, RG58 is about 18 dB of loss or so per 100 feet, which is quite significant. So that kind of cable will definitely limit how far away you can remote mount your antennas. But if you step up to something like an RG213, then it's only about 6 dB of loss per 100 feet. So you could go pretty far um, without even needing an external amplifier. The basic rule of thumb here is you want to keep your cable loss to under 5 dB. You can typically withstand that, and that won't affect the performance of the system too much unless you're really at the you know edges of the range and pushing the range of the system. But for most applications, that's an acceptable amount of loss in the cable. Uh, here's just a few more um, different cable types. The RG8X type cable is what we use on our uh, pre-made 25 and 50 foot cables, and that's about 10 dB or so loss per 100 feet. Um, the RG213, which is what Sure uses on our 100 foot cables, again, about 6 dB of loss. And then RG8, which is like a Belden 9913 or a, a similar type of cable would be Times Microwave LMR400. Now you're only losing about 3 dB per 100 feet at 600 megahertz. And that's pretty good stuff. Uh, but it's a half inch diameter cable with a solid center conductor. It is not fun to work with and it's really expensive. So, you know, you don't necessarily always have to use that kind of cable, but if you have a several hundred foot cable run, even with amplification, that may be your, your only option. Uh, sometimes the question comes up, is it okay to use 75 ohm cable? And what's your opinion on that? Well, you know, a lot of times uh, a slight mismatch is is not going to be uh, the end of the world, and sometimes 75 ohm cable is readily readily available and uh, fairly inexpensive, and can work for you in a pinch. Um, the the one downside of 75 ohm cable, of course, there is a mismatch to our antennas and our receivers, which are designed at, at 50 ohms. Uh, the receiver filters are also designed at 50 ohms, so. The, the filtering might not be as effective uh, with a 75 ohm load as so if you were trying to reject some out of band signals um, that re receivers filtering performance may may suffer a little bit uh, but if you're not having any issues with interference or, or uh, and you're not trying to go for maximum range uh, 75 ohm cable can work fine okay um, and then again, if there is too much loss in the cable, um, let's say you're using RG8X because it's what you have and you've got to go 100 feet, which puts you down 10 dB, that's where you think about adding in inline amplification to make up for some of that loss. The important thing is that the amplifier should go with the antenna, not with the receiver, because if you put it at the receiver, you've already lost a bunch of signal through the cable and you're just amplifying more noise than anything else at that point. So you really want to have that amplifier out there with the antenna, with the appropriate amount of gain. For example, our inline amplifiers have selectable 3 or 10 dB of gain, and you know you choose that based again upon how much loss there is uh, in the cable so that you're within that sort of acceptable range. Our receivers and antenna distros actually can um, support two antenna amplifiers in line per side. Um, and uh, an important point there is you wouldn't put both amplifiers directly right next to each other, but you'd put one maybe halfway down the cable to add in that second stage of right. gain. Yeah, the first amplifier might overload the second amplifier if you don't, uh, if you don't have some loss in between. So right. we want to space them apart. But otherwise, this is a perfectly acceptable solution over, over longer cable runs. Now, again, you wouldn't want to just keep stacking amplifiers up because eventually you're just going to add more noise than anything else. So, right. but Ad Additional okay. gain won't, won't, uh, won't get you longer range. It just right. amplifies the noise. Right. And so really it becomes just an algebra problem. Um, when, you know, you want to, you have an antenna location in mind, you have a receiver location in mind, you need the cabling to get there. Um, again, the limitations are the cable that you're using and the number of amplifiers. So you just plug the numbers in and you add, you know, there's, you know, you got 60B of gain from the fact that this is a directional antenna. Then you've got some amplifier gain, but some cable loss. Maybe you have a second amplifier with more gain and more loss. Again, as long as you're kind of within that 5 dB window, um, you're pretty much uh, where you want to be in terms of the operation of the system itself. So it's all just plugging in the numbers and figuring it out. Um, another thing about uh, antennas just in general in these systems is that there's no requirement for any sort of symmetry. That is, in a diversity system with an A antenna and a B antenna, they don't have to be the same. You could have an omni on one side and a, 
log periodic on the other side or a helical. Um, the cable lengths don't have to be the same. Uh, you know, you just want to make sure there's not too much loss in either cable run. But other than that, symmetry does not does not make a difference to these types of systems. So to sort of sum up our best practices here, again, um, for remote mounting antennas, no quarter wave antennas. It has to be a half wave antenna or either log periodic helical antenna. Position for best line of sight, again, meaning that the radio wave can see it, not just your eye, your eyeballs. Um, and then um, two feet of separation is your optimum separation for diversity performance. And again, no more than five dB of loss um, through your antenna system accomplished by using the shortest cable lengths, right? We don't ever see cable coiled up on the floor and the ceiling unused when you don't need it. So minimum cable length with the lowest loss cable to get the job done and amplifiers if needed. And don't over amplify the system. I mean, this plays again directly into what we talked to about not getting too close, not using too high of power on transmitters and not over amplifying the signal. Again, if it's a long, extreme long range application, you know, and up to about 5 dB of additional gain is acceptable, but you really want to keep, you know, your total antenna gain to less than 5 dB. So no more than 5 dB of loss, no more than 5 dB of gain. All right, let's take a quick look here at antenna distribution. Uh, again, I think we already explained sort of what the benefit of this was, which is, again, you don't want to have closely spaced antennas stacked right on top of each other in a rack because of the issues and interactions we talked about earlier, but also from a practical point of view, if you're remote mounting antennas, say you have 10 diversity receivers, that's 20 antennas, you probably don't want to have to pull cable and remote mount 20 antennas. You'd rather just remote mount a single pair of antennas. Antenna distribution allows you to accomplish that. If you do it passively to two receivers, that's easily done with just a passive splitter, which will cause about 3 dB of additional loss, um, which is okay. Again, that's within our 5 dB of total loss that we said is acceptable, but you can't just keep stringing these passive, dis uh, passive splitters together because every time you do that, there's another 3 dB of loss. So for more than two receivers, you're really getting into what we call an active antenna distribution, which the back panel of which is pictured on the top of this um, stack here. And here you have two antennas, A and B, feeding the two inputs of the antenna distro, and then four receivers getting um, a split and, and amplified version of that antenna signal so that essentially each receiver is seeing the same amount of gain as if it was directly connected to the antennas for the most part. Um, so that gives you optimal performance from each receiver. You can cascade these things together. So if you have another bank of receivers with another distro, we've just cascaded from the output of one to the inputs of the second one. And now we've got a total of eight receivers down to one pair of antennas. However, you can't keep doing this ad nauseum uh, because again, it's an active distro, it's an active device, which adds noise to the signal. So if you kept cascading down further and further levels, but add more noise to the signal, which is isn't necessarily a good thing. So what we would recommend is for larger systems, you set up something like this. We've got one kind of master antenna distro, and then each output of this distro is feeding a second level or second layer of distros, and then you've got receivers connected to those outputs. So now in this scenario, no receiver is any more than two steps away from the antenna directly, uh, and that's that's pretty much where you want to be. So now we've got 16 receivers all sharing the same pair of antennas works great. Another way to approach it is some receivers have cascaded antenna outputs. In other words, there's antenna inputs and outputs on every receiver. And this allows you with a single pair of antennas feeding the top receiver to just jump from one to the next, to the next, to the next, all the way down. Uh, and this works fine. It's a great way to save money on antenna distros. Uh, there are some limitations to be aware of. Number one, again, you can't keep going um, to an infinite number of uh, devices here. So you need to uh, to keep in mind that uh, there's a, a limitation which you can find out from the manufacturer in terms of how many you can cascade. For the sure you are four plus receivers here, that's about 10 receivers total. Uh, and also keep in mind that the only signal that's going to pass through these cascade ports, it's, it's kind of band limited to the frequency band of the device itself. So if this was a sure G1 band up top, you can only connect additional G1 band receivers through these cascade ports here. And then the final caveat is also keep in mind, if this receiver in the middle of the pile loses power or goes down for some reason, then every receiver after it is not going to get a signal anymore. So you want to just 
be aware of that. Again, it seems like a great idea because I'd save all this money on antenna distros, but a lot of professionals prefer, you know, uh, this approach instead because um, then they're not dependent on every other receiver to make sure that your signal continues to flow. Um, both are valid approaches, but just be aware of what the trade-offs are. The last thing we want to touch on really quickly here is the idea of antenna combining, which is uh, multi-zone antenna coverage. You may, maybe multiple rooms with a pair of antennas in each room, all feeding a common set of receivers so that no, no matter which mic you take into the room, you'll get a pickup of that signal. We're starting to get a lot more requests for these types of designs today, which are feasible and, and doable, um, but again, with the appropriate caveats. This is typically done using passive combiners, um, which is really just the same thing as our passive splitter that we saw, but turned around and used the other direction. Um, it can be done with active combiners, like the uh, uh, the uh, combiners that we make for our in-ear monitor transmitters. They can be modified to work as antenna combiners as well, but um, it's often it's quite an expensive solution. Most people tend to go with the passive approach, which can be something as simple as this, where it's just, it's just a two-room system with an A and a B antenna in each room, and that's important. We don't have two a antennas in room one and two B antennas in room two, but it's an A and a B in each room backwards through the passive combiners here, which brings that signal to a common set of receivers. So any for the four mics can be used in either room. There's 3 dB of loss that we need to account for because of the passive combiner. But other than that, that's how you approach it. And these things can be scaled up. In a, maybe a hotel ballroom that's divisible, you might have air walls that divide one large room into three smaller rooms. If the air walls are relatively transparent to RF, you can maybe still get away with only four antennas. You just want to make sure that they're arranged in such a way that there's um, at least one antenna in every room when the walls close up and they're arranged A, B, A, B. Again, not two A's and two B antennas. That makes the diversity circuitry able to do what it needs to do. Uh, but if the rooms are truly isolated, something like this, now maybe you need a pair of antennas in each room. So an A and a B antenna in each room, passive combiners, and probably more amplifiers, because again, we're losing 3 dB for every one of these combiners. Depending on how much loss is in the cable, we may need additional amplifiers, which may require a device called a bias T, which adds more um, power to support the additional amplifiers. So um, you can scale these things up. Um, again, here's a four-room application. Here's a casino. Maybe it's not multiple rooms, but it's an, ex an extremely large space with lots of obstructions in the way. This is, again, a casino floor where they had one wireless mic, but they wanted to walk around the whole floor of the casino and be able to make announcements from anywhere. So you had to kind of put up this sort of complicated antenna system. Again, notice alternating A, B, A, B, A, B, all the way around to make sure that they had good coverage. So basically what we're coming down to here is some, some, some guidelines to keep in mind. Um, you want to always conduct a detailed site survey. You want to get plans that look like sort of the plans I just showed you, right, where you can see exactly what's going on, know exactly the kind of coverage you need and where the antennas need to go. And specify a high quality receiver. Again, you need a system with, you know, good diversity performance, good filtering, because often the more antennas you put out there, the more chances you have of picking up unwanted signals and the noise floor can go up because of the amplifiers. So you don't want to do this with the cheapest wireless mic you can get your hands on. <laughs> you want to use a high quality receiver. You want to follow all of the rules we've already talked about for remote mounting antennas. Those apply double when we're talking about this sort of a setup here. And it's not going to be cheap. You just have to accept that. Um, often just in the labor and the cabling itself. If you're doing this, these large of spaces, that much cable, you're probably looking at the RG8 type cable, and the plenum rated RG8 runs like $4 a foot, so it's not cheap. And then, as I mentioned, that half-inch solid cable with the solid center conductor is not easy to pull either. So, um, you know, you might try to do it with cheaper cable, but then you've made a big compromise there that you probably didn't want to. So just be prepared for that. And there are alternatives. You know, sometimes the customers don't realize that, you know, often you can just Create zones with dedicated receivers for each zone rather than trying to use any mic in any room. It'll be far more affordable or just have portable wireless racks that you roll into the room and use where needed. There are there are alternatives. But again, with the proper careful design, um, the right qualifications, these can work and they do. There's lots of them out there. Here's some of the accessories that we often encounter here uh, for these applications. Um, you can see these all on our website. Speaking of our website, I just want to leave you with one thing here that's really important, the wireless accessory wizard on the Sure website. Um, if you've never played with this, it's under um, 
support and tools, and then the wireless accessory wizard. What you can do here, if you remember nothing else from this webinar today, remember this page on our website. You go here and you choose a sure wireless system. Uh, let's choose, say, the new QLXD, for example. Choose a frequency band. Tell it how many receivers you have. Let's say 12. And yes, we're going to rack mount them. And yes, we're going to remote mount our antennas. And the antennas need to be um, over 100 feet away. And we want to use the directional antennas. Lo and behold, here's a parts list and a setup diagram. You can't lose. <laughs> you get everything you need, all the parts, cables included, and the correct way to do your antenna distro and your amplifiers and all of that to make sure that the system works as you need it to work. Um, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty useful tool that takes into account all of the things that we've discussed during our webinar here today. The other tool allows you to just simply put in a cable length for how far you're going to remote mount your antennas, and it'll give you a couple options in terms of what cable to use or what amplifiers you might add. So a useful thing. And finally, a plug for our next webinar, which is really kind of part two, a continuation of how to properly set up your wireless system, is once you've got your antennas system sorted out, you want to make sure that your frequencies are coordinated properly. Those two things really go hand in hand to make sure your system is going to work uh, the way you need it to. Uh, registration should be open soon for that webinar, and I'm going to toss it back to Cheryl. Okay, thanks, Gino and Mark. Lots of great information. Unfortunately, we are out of time today. There were a couple of great questions that we weren't able to get to, but if you want to send those to support at sure.com, um, one of our applications engineers will be happy to get an answer back to you. Um, so we just want to thank you so much for joining us. And um, you can go to sure.com slash training to sign up for future webinars and also to get all the archives. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next month.